you want the look of a prime but the flexibility of a zoom lens here's vertigo by multi turret this is a synody gear news video supported by b and h and cvp Welcome everybody here from NAB 2023. I'm Nino from Synity and we are here in the press room with Ian. How are you? I'm well. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. I mean, we last time we talked was exactly four years ago. The world was a different place. Um, we're still here, alive and kicking. We made it. We made it through. Um, and we actually talked about the same product. We talked about your lens turret. Right. So now you're back. Yeah. What's different? Well, we've spent the last four years essentially just beating the crap out of our prototype, making sure that it was sort of ready to be shared with the world. And uh, it was such a nice response that we got in 2019 and a big part, thanks to you, um, that we, it kind of scared me a bit because, you know, I thought, oh, geez, what if, what if this thing gets out there and it's not really like, what if it doesn't work? I'm going to piss off all these cinematographers. So kind of took a step back and I just started using it on all my shows and trying to break it, trying to find out where the edge was. So we brought it to the Arctic, it's been to the desert, it's been to rainforests, and it's still working, um, which is somewhat of a surprise, to be honest, because you expect a prototype to break somewhere, and this thing just keeps ticking. So at this point now, I have no excuse not to release it to the wild. And, and every time I post a picture, people are like, why, why are you posting this picture? Why don't you just sell it already? So we're kickstarting it June 2nd to 8th for one week. It'll be starting off at Cine Gear. And that'll be a chance for people to uh, to get their hands on it finally. Very cool. I mean, a lot of time has passed also with new cameras. I mean, I think at the time you still showed it to me on the FS7. That's right. Now we have an FX9 and the FX6 here. Yeah, so the FX, uh, it, the turret actually just slammed right onto the FX. It was it was a great day when we just realized it fit right on the FX9. No the same cinema mount as on the FS7 Mark II, right? It is, but you'd be surprised because these little projections on the body sometimes, like little foot that you don't even think of normally. Well, when you're trying to jam something super tight to keep within the tolerances, yeah. then it's a problem. Like this little foot on the bottom of the FX6 caused me so much headache. Um, so, but yeah, so it fits on the, uh, the FX nine and then we've made this new version of a prototype that fits on an FX six. And this is nice because it's off to the side and it's raised up as opposed to this one, which the, the, the weight hangs low. So it just makes for a really nice compact package running around. It kind of reminds me of like an IMO, like a world war two ish kind of looking thing. And, um, I've had a lot of fun with this just on music projects and, and yeah, that, it is very light. And I, I said before, I mean, the cool thing is when you think about it, if this really works, which I'm assuming it does because you used it all the time, um, it's, it's, you can, you can use primes as if you had a zoom on your camera. Because instead of using, I don't know, a 16, 35, I might use a 16, a 20, and a 35. Right. And so you get the stop of a prime, which is nice, especially full frame. So you you got, yeah. one, this is all one fours, for example, as most of these are too. Um, and you also get your zoom range. So in this case, I can go from a 20 to an 85, one four, and then one other lens in between. And, you know, as you're walking into a scene, you decide, well, what lenses am I going to be using in here? You build kind of load out for that scene. You shoot it that way. And you get the look of your prime, but you get the flexibility of a zoom. You don't need to stop to change lenses. We've all felt the pain. Everybody out there has missed something while changing a lens. And so to be able to do that, particularly full frame, when we just, the zoom ratios are too small now, I find for documentary shooting, even 17 to 120 was not enough. It wasn't wide enough for me and not long enough. And now, you know, that you can't on a full frame camera, you can't even use that lens. So um, yeah, this is a response to that frustration. And uh, it's really just the fastest way to change a lens. I mean, even, you know, you do a set down interview where you can't really change lenses when uh, the interviewee is asking questions. You might just do that now. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So you can just bash in really quick for, a, you know, it, things get emotional. You're on primes, but you can't push in. You know, you, so, oh, sorry, hold hold that moment of emotion while I, no, it's not going to happen. But here I can just, if I was on a 35 for the wide, now I'm on my 85. It didn't make any commotion. Didn't make any noise. Person could stay in the moment. I'm not imposing myself or my process on this documentary moment that I'm trying not to screw up. So you're still using a Metabones for uh, any... So this one is our easy, er, earlier uh, version. This one, we've actually included the board inside. So oh. now when we pull the turret off, and this, is, this is one of the best things I say about this whole setup, is that it comes off like a lens. So as soon as I release the breech, it just comes right off. It basically fits in your lens case about that thick. 
and as I say, the board's inside now, so we don't have to use a Metabones on the outside. I like that idea because I'm cheap. I'm like, ah, that way they don't need to buy another lens adapter. But my, my designer's like, yeah, of course, right. it's better if you include it. Also, you it makes you less dependent on a different kind of product, right? Right. And if something, I don't know, if that Metabones got damaged or something, this way it's nicely protected. So, and yeah. Very nice. So you're going to kickstart this, you said, and um, are these going to be specifically for the FX9 and the FX6? Yeah, so first out of the gate would be an FX9 slash Vanish slash FS7 Mark II version, because I know that works. I beat the, as I said, beat the heck out of it. And so with a slight modification, we could probably use either the same one or just change the back plate in order to be use it with an FX6. So th those would be the two one's right out of the gate. We have tested on Airy. We've tested on Canon RF mounts. If they'd come up with a larger RF camera, it'd be brilliant because AF would work fantastic. But the first two out of the gate are likely going to be for E-mount, then possibly something for Komodo, something along those lines. Very cool. So it seems kind of production ready. Um, so once you have kickstarted it, that's one of the questions people always ask with Kickstarter projects. You know, when are you planning to ship? And do you have a production partner or what's the plan there? So. Uh, we've been talking again to a number of folks here, both from Europe and from, from Asia, about potentially partnering on this. I just want to get in people's hands. So if, if a partnership works great and it gets it out faster, fantastic. Otherwise, we're ready to do this. And the plans are ready to go. Our 3D files are ready to print. What we'd like to do prior to actually starting the Kickstarter is just reach out to other cinematographers saying, what are the little changes that we can make? Here's what I think I'd like to make the handle design a little different. The little tweaks that we can make to make it perfect. And then... I suspect we'll have the it within people's hands within four to six months at the outside. It's not complex. Like everything we've done here, yeah. we we cool. basically hand built this one. I, I'm pretty confident we could we could shell out another hundred pretty quick. Awesome. And do you have any pricing in mind yet for Kickstarter? That's the trick because I I want I think too much like a cinematographer and I want to keep the costs low. But I'm also aware that particularly if we we're doing this ourselves. Uh, that we want to make sure that we're not going to disappoint anybody. So we've basically looked at a bunch of different manufacturing options. The biggest cost is the machining, essentially. And uh, I think where we're kind of landing right now is what the cost of a nice prime lens, nice, you know, probably like something along around the cost of this. Um, but what I'm really interested in is reaching out to the other cinematographers who are interested in this beforehand, just to get a sense of what feature set we might want to update. Because, you know, that, that cost that we've been estimating around is essentially replicating this but I, I know there's a few little adjustments that we can make that probably make everybody really happy and may not add a lot. Or maybe people are saying, you know what, we'd really like that. And if that costs an extra two, 300 bucks, we're happy. So yeah, roughly the cost of a nice prime lens. We'll try to keep it at that. Okay, I'm very curious, very much looking forward to, you know, seeing the Kickstarter kickoff. And whenever you're ready and whenever you have a production version, we're very happy to review it, of course. Lovely, yeah. lovely. Oh, thank you. All right. Good luck with the, with the Kickstarter. And, uh, of course, we'll also report about that and keep our audience updated about that. So, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Stay tuned to CineD for more from NAB 2023. When you see this, there might be already like 30 videos online. Um, but, uh, yeah, stay tuned. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks.